So if you had um, if you had a woman who was um, starting HRT, um, somebody with no particular history, but if you had somebody who's starting HRT, how should it be started? You know, sort of how should obviously she should be talked through the options, but from a kind of dosing point of view. And the reason I ask is because we have quite a lot of women who will come to the group who will say they're on HRT or they've been on HRT for a while. Their dose has been, it's their estrogen dose, has been increased several times, but they're not feeling better. So I guess it's kind of a two part question. One is, how would you start it? And the second one is, I get, I suppose it's three parts actually, sorry. Second part is, are there some women who just don't get on with it? And can you have too much estrogen? So um, so how you started, you would, you would look at it. And I suppose before I answer that question, I suppose you can always look at it and say, when you're trying to look at replacement, you've got an also, not just replacement, at optimization later yeah. on, you ask yourself three questions. How much are you giving the woman? How much is she getting from what you're giving her? Because absorption varies from one individual to another. And how much does that individual need? Mm -hmm. So you could have two people who you give, for example, an Everall 50 patch, and one of them will fully absorb it and the other one might absorb half of it. So that's one variation already started with two people who you've given the same amount. But let's say they're both absorbed the same amount from the Everall 50. One of them may say, I'm feeling perfectly fine, back to normal. And the other one says, I'm still feeling awful because that other person needs a higher dose. Mm -hmm. So you would often say you would start with what is standard and then you modify as needed. Now, what is standard is the next question. Good question. <laughs> uh, is, is to say, depending on the background. Right. So if you look at it, if you're starting in someone who is 50, it's going to be different to starting in someone who is 30, and it's going to be different to starting in someone who is 60 or 65. Yeah. Now, yeah. if you're starting in someone who is 50, we will start with a standard. And what a standard would be, would be, you could say, a, a 50 microgram patch would be a reasonable starting point, mm -hmm. two measures of gel if you're looking at estrogel, or one milligram of, of sandrina if you're looking in that respect, mm -hmm. a, 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 a one milligram oral preparation as, as a potential starting point. Mm -hmm. If you look at the younger premature ovarian insufficiency, we generally tend to run higher with the starting dose, let's yeah. say a 75 patch or along an equivalence in, in that sense because they need physiological levels of replacement. Yeah. And if you look at someone who's, let's say, 60, 61, who's starting afresh, you would start with a small dose, but you can build up to what they need depending on, on where they are. So yeah. that's your kind of starting point. Yeah. Where you go from there is a question of, of course, assessing the response. So let's just say you've got someone on a, an Everall 50 patch and they're getting, and you waited sort of, let's say, two months or so, and they've still got ongoing symptoms you can go up to the next step of going, let's say to Everall 75, and you could give it another sort of two to three months. And if they've still got symptoms, you might think of going about to Everall 100. So the dose would be adjusted in the context as well, because you could say for symptom control is where the symptom benefit gets. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you could adjust it to what's needed. Now, if you wanna turn it around and say, where is the safety issue in that you, we know with transdermal, I mean, again, it's a point we covered in the previous question of saying, what are the risks? What about the risk of blood clots with HRT? And, and in that sense, you would say that with oral estrogen, there is a small increase in the risk of blood clots. With transdermal, we know there is no increase in risk of blood clots. So going back to the contraindications, you would say venous thrombosis now is not a contraindication, but it is an indication for us to give HRT in a certain way. Yeah. So we see many people with blood clots, lung clots, various vascular risks. When we discuss with our hematology team, they're perfectly happy for them to take transdermal estrogen and micronized progesterone. And what we say to the patient in that sense, your background risk is high, mm -hmm. but we are not increasing your risk at all by giving you transdermal estrogen and micronized progesterone. Right. So going back to that aspect of us saying that if you're going to up the dose, and we know now as well, not only is transdermal neutral, low doses of transdermal and high doses are also neutral. So really, if you're giving someone an Everall 75 or Everall 100, you're not increasing their risk of blood clots above 
where, where they are. Mm. So from an estrogen dose point of view, I would, like I said, that's, that's the, the, the way I would go with it in that, in that respect. And so second part of the question is, are there some women who just don't get on with HRT? And the third part is, can you have too much estrogen? So are there some women who don't get on with HRT? Some people do get some sensitivity to the estrogen intake. So you do find some people who would say, right, I'm gonna get a bit of breast sensitivity, a breast tenderness. Often with that group, you will find it is probably, and most I would say, it's more the sensitivity to the reintroduction. They've had the gap without taking it. Often with that group, you find if you lower the dose, give it a bit longer time, you probably will then manage to adjust it up again. Okay. Now, there are a group where you're going to sit somewhere in the middle and you're going to say, we need to find a balance between what is giving you the sensitivity and what is controlling the symptoms. And you might say somewhere in between might be the right for that individual. They are a small group. They're a really yeah. small group. Yeah. Are there group? Are there people who are sensitive to the estrogen in a PMS, PMDD style? Fortunately, a very, very small minority. So the vast majority of people with PMS, PMTD, uh, or premenstrual syndrome, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, the vast majority are sensitive to the fluctuations rather than sensitive to the hormones. To the hormone. But you do have a very small proportion who are sensitive to the progesterone, who will tell you from ovulation to my period, I feel awful. Yeah. And, and you have a very, very rare group who are sensitive to both. And unfortunately, right. they're a small group. But okay. the vast majority of people who we see who don't get on with it would be people who it's really just finding the balance. And if you build up slowly, they'll be fine. Okay. Is there an upper limit that you would use? I would say it's what is what the patient needs. So if you're going to okay. find a patient who, but of course, it's building up within reason. So I would always say go up to what you need. But if what you need is going to end up being a high dose, that's fine. You build it up to what you need. But I'm not going to say to you, for example, not that you would necessarily always check blood levels, but if you were to check blood levels and you find an individual is needing a level of 600, 700 to get good symptom control, there's no harm that comes with that. That's what that individual needs. But of yeah. course, if you need a higher dose, I would suggest that you're on transdermal yeah. because then you would say, we know we're not giving you any added risk from a point of view of blood clots. And from the Lancet meta-analysis, we know that those doesn't make a difference from the risk of breast cancer. So you could say you give the patient what they need, but of course, having put it to the test in a gradual stepwise manner. And is there a level that you're looking for to, you know, kind of to offer that long-term, long-term health effect? So again, it goes back to the context of who are we talking about? So if we're right. talking about naturally menopausal beyond the age of 50, the answer yeah. is symptom control. So for that group, we're not looking at the levels. So right. in right. naturally menopausal women, if you say to me, when would I measure a blood test? I would measure it if I'm suspecting that you're not absorbing the, the level. So let's say if you're on Everall 50 and you say to me, I've still got symptoms, I'll say to you, go to Everall 75. And if you say to me, I've still got symptoms, I would want to see your estrogen to say, is the issue here, is your estrogen really low that you're not absorbing anything or are you actually just needing a higher dose? Yeah. So it might help that discussion. If you look at the premature ovarian insufficiency group, we are aiming for a physiological level. Ideally, you would say above 200, Okay. generally speaking. So we are in a way in that category, slightly treating the level. Slightly different, yeah. And the 50 above, you're treating the symptoms, but the levels may guide you to make that decision. Yep. If you look at osteoporosis and you say to me, where would it fit in with that group? So yes, so you're 51, you're, you've got osteoporosis and you've got some, and you're taking HRT. The evidence would tell us that whether it's low dose or high dose, they're both going to improve bone density, but there is evidence to suggest that the higher the dose, the more the beneficial the bone effect. So right. Generally okay. speaking, I would say with that group, I would go with the standard dose and rely mainly on symptom control because we know with that you're going to give them good, sufficient control of, of, of bone protection from that point of view. 